Hi, and welcome to another lecture here today. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, James Baldwin's short story, Going to Meet the Man. Uh, this is the last selection in the uh, book that you have for this course, his collection of short stories. Um, I have uh, prepared uh, some fairly extensive uh, lecture notes here. I'll probably uh, read very uh, little from the actual text here and just kind of be referring to pages. Uh, and let's get right into it. So I think right away, um, I can't say we have an unreliable narrator as uh, this is a third person narration uh, as we're kind of brought into uh, the kind of life of Jesse. And then of course we get that flashback uh, of, of him witnessing uh, what he witnesses uh, when he was a child. Um, but we do have um, a, a unreliable main character in the sense that he is uh, obviously so flawed uh, and uh, you could probably even argue is quite a, a tragic character on some level. Um, so, you know, if we, if we look at this text uh, as, you know, in terms of hindsight uh, and we think about the progress we've made uh, as far as racial concerns uh, go, then we look at this character very questioningly, and it's amazing. Uh, and this is one of the general questions I, I do have um, that I'll probably ask the class in some capacity. I don't think I put this on the discussion questions, but it's such an interesting question, which is, why would Baldwin, the author of this piece, give us a narrator like this? Um, I don't think there's uh, really any salvageable uh, and likable characteristics for Jesse. Uh, there's just a lot of negative things we could probably say uh, about him, uh, especially just as far as his kind of hardcore racism is concerned uh, and how indoctrinated into this perspective on black people uh, he is. So, but, but why give us a narrator like this um, does Baldwin feel as if this type of character may have an effect on the reader? And if so, uh, what is that effect? Uh, another question that you did have on your discussion questions is after reading the story, and I'll tell you, I, I read a lot of you know literature. I read a lot of short stories. I love short stories. It might be my favorite medium uh, of literature. Uh, but I've never read one as shocking as this story. I mean, I don't think Baldwin holds back in terms of the context that he presents, especially when we talk about that flashback and, and what's going on there. And we're left to kind of digest it and, and try to make sense of it on some analytical level and thematic level, I would imagine as well. Um, but what was your, your overall reaction to this story? Uh, that's one of the questions on, uh, that you'll be answering. Um, all right, so let's kind of obviously take it page by page to some degree. So um, his wife right in the beginning uh, is, uh, her name is Grace. Uh, I think, you know, it's pretty obvious that her, you know, literally her name is Grace, but she is the figurative representation of Grace. And when we talk about Grace, maybe we're talking about the grace of God. If there's anything uh, that Jesse is in deep need of, it's salvation. Uh, it, it's the grace of God, especially as far as a redemption for his sinful uh, uh, nature uh, and, and the sins that he kind of uh, instigates against humanity, right? Uh, so he's in need of this grace. Now, it's interesting, um, the only time we really uh, have these scenes with Grace is when he's trying to have sex with her, uh, whether it's in the beginning here, he's having issues uh, uh, with impotence, uh, or uh, at the end of the text as well, uh, when he says some pretty uh, interesting things. Uh, he always seems to, uh, whenever we have Grace involved, he's just trying to have sex with her, right? Uh, and again, if you figuratively kind of, you know, take that, uh, he's trying to have sex with this idea of grace from God. And maybe that's not the way to approach grace in that respect. It's not going to come through some kind of, you know, anim uh, uh, some uh, um, instinctual kind of lust or drive for sex. For him, it seems to be a kind of power trip. Um, we get a couple pieces of evidence for that. Um, she is likened, uh, on page 229, she's likened to a frail sanctuary. And I guess that's what 
grace is for Jesse. It's something that's incredibly frail, uh, maybe even non-existent or barely there. Uh, and it's something that maybe he has to uh, really work at uh, and go through some major introspective processes uh, in order to achieve or obtain that grace. Um, it does mention uh, he's kind of, you know, he's always thinking about what he's going to confront uh, in the day. And here it says he knows that black people are getting ready. Uh, and we understand that there's this series of kind of protests and marches. Uh, what it does seem like is that they're trying to um, kind of fortify uh, these lines to register to vote. It seems like we're in these changing times, which is why maybe Jesse, sat, Jesse is having such a hard time with it. Uh, we're in these changing times. Maybe we're talking about reconstruction. Uh, maybe we're talking about, you know, civil rights movement where black people are now granted the right to vote or are um, more so uh, granted the right to vote and now they're really working to fortify uh, that right and I think that's what we have here uh, in the beginning of the text. It is important to note uh, that the story takes place during the civil rights era uh, and believe it or not we're not following a civil rights a member of the civil rights movement instead Baldwin gives us a, a, a thorough racist who is trying to keep these changes and this social progress at bay. Um, we're seeing the things he has to do to, to, to keep those changes from occurring. Um, so we are following a racist, a white policeman uh, through this time. Uh, all of this forces him to flash back to a time when whites were in complete control, no resistance, no clamoring of wills, human rights, and tireless voices. That's what he's dealing with in the present. On page 230, there is a fixation of sorts on impotence and not being able to get an erection. Uh, I think if you read through this story and you always annotate things on your own at first to see what stands out uh, for you, what, what seems to be important. And this fixation on the groin or the male genitalia uh, or, uh, and issues surrounding that definitely is a part of this text. And so we have to ask ourselves, how do we move beyond the literal kind of male genitalia and start to discuss it in the figurative or the broader implications of what the male genitalia uh, is, especially when we see the contention of race, uh, or at least the perceived contention of race, which really occupies Jesse's mind, right? White versus black, white man versus black man. And where do women uh, fall in this? Black women, white women, right? It's a major theme of this text. Uh, and so we're always paying attention when we're focused in on this aspects of the male genitalia. Um, this must remind us in part, if I'm flash forwarding, I'm gonna speak uh, about this story in totality today. This must remind us in part with the castration of the black man that he witnessed as a child, uh, where it's probably even worse than a castration in the sense that they cut the whole thing off. They cut the whole, penis off of that black man and maybe that's why it's always on his mind right issues uh, of impotence or something dealing with uh, the penis here um, one of the questions you have here and I know it can be a little awkward but we're, we're really dealing with this in the figurative sense that's what makes these discussions uh, kind of more interesting I guess you could say more significant what are uh, the broader implications of a man who cannot get it up? Well, literally, I, I, I can't get it up. I'm having impotence issues. But what are the broader implications of that, right? Um, to give one idea, a man is not a man unless he can get an erection. So uh, on a more figurative sense, it takes away from uh, our manhood. Uh, maybe it takes away from uh, this role with, that we're supposed to play within a society here. If I can't get an erection, what does that mean about my relationship of power with a woman, right? Is that somehow uh, altered uh, if I just can't get this erection? So there's broader implications to it. Uh, that's one of the questions that you've been dealing with. Um, he prefers to, um, it does mention, he's very lustful. Uh, he's got this kind of sexual drive and urge. And then he starts talking about black women. In fact, it seems like he prefers to be with black women more than he does uh, Grace, uh, who I, I would imagine, though it's never stated specifically, but I would imagine is a white woman. If he was married to a black woman, that would be 
completely shocking. Uh, but I would imagine it's a white woman, Grace. Uh, but he does prefer to pick up an arrest, which he says is basically the same thing. To pick up a black woman on the street uh, or arrest them, it really makes no difference because in the end it, it, it arrives at sex, right? That's what it ends up being for him. Um, so he prefers to pick up or arrest a black girl to get a spicier sex than Grace can provide. So he's looking for something spicier. Um, and, and you might ask yourself, well, what does he mean by spicier? Is it something that's kind of taboo? A black man getting with a white, I'm sorry, a white man getting with a black woman. Is there something that's uh, essentially uh, forbidden as far as a society is concerned, a white kind of society is concerned? So why does he find it spicier? He does, when he's thinking about having sex and, and how he has had sex with all these black women, he starts to fear for his own life. He thinks, you know, maybe she's going to take advantage of me and kill me. Uh, maybe some black men will, will find me in the act uh, and they'll kill me. So he's got a deep fear of a kind of black retribution or a black violence. He has a real deep fear of this. So deep that we could probably start to say, is this an impetus for the formation of, of his identity and who he is as a person, right? This fear that he has of black people. I always love to mention this, 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 this argument, I guess you could say. Um, I guess the question first is, do white people fear black people uh, and some kind of violence and retribution? Um, I always love to point out when we talk about hip hop and rap music, uh, you know, now we live in the day of kind of online, you know, digital uh, uh, music and stuff. It's different than, you know, record sales of, of, of former eras. Uh, a lot has changed, but still, I would imagine if you kind of break down the statistics, who is the number one consumer of rap and hip hop? And when I ask that question, a lot of my students in the classroom will say, oh, black people, obviously, right? It's kind of music. Uh, by black people, for black people, right, by and large. And in my quick response is no, actually. Uh, black people are not uh, the main consumer of, uh, of rap and hip hop. Uh, it's actually white kids, right? Mainly because it's the white kids who have the money to buy these albums and, uh, you know, go on iTunes and purchase the music uh, in the first place. Of course, notwithstanding private, uh, piracy and, and kind of what happens there. Um, however, so you got white kids who are the main consumer of black music, but what are they learning to do when they listen to this black music? They're learning to fear black people, especially when you consider the violent lyrics, uh, the intimidating lyrics uh, that is kind of put out in this music. White people are buying the music and ironically learning to be afraid of black people in the process. It's, it's a very interesting, almost an amazing situation that takes place there, right? Jesse has this fear. You might ask yourself as a white man, I ask myself the same question, do I fear black people in this kind of way? Uh, and that can get you going on some interesting introspection, right? Really thinking about your own feelings about and sentiments toward a particular people. Uh, and that's what I think a story like this has to do for us, right? No matter who you are, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, Middle Eastern, uh, Native American, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You, you have to start asking yourself these questions, right? All right. Where do you think this fear that Jesse has comes from? And the next question is, is it a justified fear or is it unjustified? I guess we'll deal with that more in the text. My response to that is when you have been the instigator of fear and violence like Jesse is. Jesse learned at an early age that you have to incur violence. Uh, uh, you have to, I'm sorry, incite violence against black people. And if you're always doing that, um, if you're the instigator of fear, violence, murder, and distrust for a long period of time, then you probably, probably begin to irrationally fear those that you subjugate and instill that fear in. This makes it easier to subjugate and dominate these populations, right? Uh, I guess another way of putting it is, I've mistreated you for so long that in the psyche uh, of my mind, I would only imagine that you would lash back at me, right? Who wouldn't? Who in the right mind would take such mis mistreatment and oppression without lashing back? And Jesse knows, or at least he feels, that that retaliation is coming. Now, here's the, here's the question. Is that retaliation from black people coming? Is it coming in the form of violent retribution against Jesse and, and people like him? 
And I think the answer to that early on in this lecture is no. In fact, there is no evidence that black people are being violent as far as a retribution is concerned. In fact, what is the retribution from black people? The gospel singing, right? I guess it's kind of a nod to uh, Martin Luther King in the civil in the in the kind of nonviolent uh, civil rights movement that he was uh, leading, uh, or at least a part of. Um, you will find retribution. That retribution will come in the form of a, a new emerging suspicion of white people and the dominance they have by black people, right? The suspicion black people have toward white people. And it will also come through this gospel music. And Jesse even says it at one point in the, um, one point in the story. He feels like the black people aren't even singing for themselves as far as kind of uh, 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 remedying their sins. They're actually singing for a wretch like Jesse, right? And if he were to really feel that way, that's got to make him feel ultimately really guilty and just tear away at his psychology, which is kind of what happens in this text. Okay, very good. Um, we also recognize he exclusively sexualizes black women, uh, and that's kind of in his mind all they are good for. Uh, one question I have, and I think this was uh, in your discussion questions, is he a, is he a hypocrite? He he hates black men uh, and black people probably in general, but he, uh, he, he has these uh, sexual desires for black women. Does that make him a hypocrite? How do we explain the hypocrisy? All right, very good. On page 230, what kills him more than anything, what devastates his mind more than anything is the singing. He does not want to hear they're singing anymore. He hears it outside the jail. He hears it outside the police station, in the streets. The singing is probably gospel tunes, which means he doesn't want to be reminded of the lack of gospel in him. All right. We do get an allusion to the River Jordan, which sounds like a little gospel uh, later on, so there'll be an exact reference to that later on. Uh, on page 231, the narrator internalizes a pretty disparaging view on black people going so far as to call them animals. I ask a, a question and you know, um, you gotta be honest with yourself. Do you feel as if this type of sentiment that black people are just animals? Uh, we get more little details to that, he, you know, the jungle, you know, straight from the jungle um, and some of these old prejudice perspectives on, on, on the African-American race uh, or the African race. Uh, do you feel as if this type of sentiment that black people are animals, do you think that still exists uh, for some white people today? Uh, and not just like in general, like, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure there's racist people. Think about your communities. I reside in Simi Valley. Uh, you might reside in you know, Thousand Oaks, Westlake, uh, you know, Moore Park, uh, maybe you're in the valley, uh, right over the hill here. Um, I know I live in, I live in Simi Valley and yeah, I think there's a lot of this sentiment that goes around. If I'm being very honest and real, um, you could say, though I always say this with a, you know, t uh, I always make, say certain things and I, I don't want it to sound like it's, it's just the way that it is, but with the Donald Trump presidency, uh, a big argument people are having is, is Trump allowing for more racist sentiments to kind of, you know, pour over into our society? They've been there all along. I mean, one thing we have to remember about Trump, um, it's not that he's a racist, it's that there is a ton of racists in our society that are now kind of throwing their hands up in the air and saying, we like Donald Trump for whatever reason. Maybe that's the reason. Um, but is there these sentiments that black people are just animals, that they are subhuman, in our very own communities. And I, I always urge you to, to, to answer honestly, right, with these kinds of questions. Um, all right, very good. This reinforces an us versus them mentality for Jesse. He sees them as uncivilized. So by default, he, as a white man, is civilized. And he even says a couple times in the story, and we have to kind of protect this, right? I am the guardian who is protecting this kind of white society from the savages, from the uncivilized. On page 231, there's a transition. Naive children who were easily taken advantage of in the past now are actively involved in civil rights and progressing their lives. There's a theme of kind of transition uh, from a boy to a man in this text. And it's really 
uh, kind of solidified at the end of the story when Jesse says he sees a similarity in the young boy that is in the jail cell with the man that was essentially tortured and killed uh, uh, and when he remembers all of that, right? So there is a connection and the only difference really is the one in the jail cell is still a boy. The one there is a man. I'll explain the connection. The one that was killed in the, in the field and all these white people watching, he is referred to by Jesse or the narration as a man. And we'll explain that a little bit differently. But there's this transition. It used to be these kids loved the candy and the things that you handed out to them. Now they're starting to wise up. The reasons why they're starting to wise up, it could be education. A big part of education is being aware of suffering, as George Orwell uh, kind of reminds us, right, uh, in his uh, piece, um, uh, Shooting uh, an Elephant. Uh, and I think he goes by his actual name. George Orwell is his pseudonym, right? So he goes by his actual name with that piece. But with education comes an awareness of suffering, an awareness of injustice. And once we start to get clued into that suffering and injustice, then we start to be suspicious uh, of those in power, right? Those who hold authority over us. First comes suspicion, next comes challenging that authority, right? You become suspicious of the authority, then you challenge it. So Jesse says, when he thinks about how these, you know, these kids are, you know, going through this transition, and now they're the types of kids that he's got to deal with, young men who is, you know, protesting for rights, uh, how dare they? Jesse says he should have poisoned them when he had the chance. And it doesn't feel like hyperbole. It doesn't feel like over-exaggeration. I think in some part, when you really understand who Jesse is, he, he's being honest, right? I should have poisoned those kids so they never transitioned into young adult men, black men, who actually had a sense of their rights uh, and uh, what rights should be afforded to them, right? I should have killed them when they were just kids and they had no idea uh, about the unfairness of our society and would have any uh, 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 thought of challenging uh, that unfairness, right? Should have killed them when I had the chance. Moving on. Page 232, there seems to be an earnest in some way discussion with God uh, as he's trying to kind of talk things out with his wife, but Grace is described as not really listening. She's kind of like half asleep, half listening. So not really engaging uh, with Jesse, uh, perhaps the way that he needs her to. Uh, he talks about the ringleader Negro. This is the young boy that I was just talking about. Uh, a moment ago. Uh, it seems like he is, it seems like, it doesn't say for sure, but I can only imagine, it seems like he is making sure black people are allowed to register to vote and that nothing gets in the way of that, right? You could imagine within these southern societies, um, when black people were, were finally given the right to vote and, and then had to, of course, register to vote, there was all kinds of intimidation coming from uh, 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 white society, especially white society, uh, who doesn't want to give them uh, the right and privilege of voting. Uh, so I think this, this ringleader Negro, as he's put, is just trying to make sure that nothing gets in the way of these people registering uh, for their vote. Because if everyone has the right to vote, all these black people have the, the right to vote now, we have to understand this is threatening to white people. It's threatening in the sense that now black people are going to be able to vote for leaders. They're going to be able to vote for laws and policies that start to overturn the dynamics of power in this uh, prior white society in this kind of white state, right? So yeah, let's keep them out uh, of this system of voting so that things simply don't change and we'll always have the power and the authority here. So always a threat, always a threat. Um, Interestingly, there is no moral dilemma or consideration of violence for Jesse. Jesse just, you know, kicks and, and, and uses the cattle prod, which is kind of an electric jolt. And he doesn't even think about the violence that he is enacting, right? Doesn't even think about it. It is a matter of fact happenstance of violence. He uses violence to stop nonviolence and uses violence more so to stop the singing again, uh, which is a, a form of nonviolence. But we have to understand here, here's the crucial point, that the singing represents grace, salvation, uh, morals, and ethics, perhaps in a more tangible way. 
You can't stop these things, these types of things, with violence. It's a fight that violence cannot win. One of the kind of strategic uh, advantages of nonviolence is that it always highlights the violence, right? I'm just going to sit here and you can beat me up and you can hit me and you can make me bleed. But one thing uh, that we're going to recognize by the time this little incident is over is that I never, never did anything and you were the one who was using violence the entire time. In fact, it's arguable that monop uh, governments have and, and states and police forces, they have a monopoly on violence, right? They get to use violence all the time and they get very little criticism about it. Well, one way of highlighting that violence is to simply stay nonviolent, right? So that could be one strategic advantage of, of nonviolence here. But for, for Jesse, he does it without even thinking. It doesn't matter to him. There is no moral and ethical consideration of the use of violence for him. It's automatic, and maybe it has a lot to do with what he's seen, right? which is why we have this flashback. Page 233, uh, Jesse cattle prods the black man's testicles. Uh, again, here we are, not that far into the text, and it's, uh, we already have another focus on the male genitalia here. right? Uh, one of the questions uh, is, what's the significance of the testicles, not just literally, but rather figuratively? And why would he feel the need to, you know, I'm going to get you right there. I'm going to, you know, yes, literally, it, it hurts a lot, I'm sure. Uh, but figuratively, why target the testes? That's where creation occurs, right? That's where the, the, the production of life happens, right? and the continuance of a people, the conception of a people, the birth and death in this kind of cycle, right? So if I'm trying to injure not just a black man in his testicles where physically it hurts, but I'm trying to essentially send a message. I don't want your people here and the continuance of your people anywhere uh, in, in our society, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to target this particular area. Uh, there's other ways of looking at it too, especially when we start talking about uh, um, masculinity and senses of, of, of black masculinity, uh, maybe that's why he's targeting this area too, because he feels threatened, right? So the best thing he can do to make himself feel like a man is to take away the manhood, or at least injure the manhood of a black man who makes him feel less of a man in the first place, right? There's the other way of looking at it. All right, very good. No matter what, with all of this violence, you can't Stop the singing. It's a plague on Jesse. Jesse kicks the boy, and it's mentioned that his foot leapt out, and he didn't even, like, he has no control over it. It just happens, right? Um, and, and, and the question, I didn't ask this in the questions, but a question is, what is animating Jesse? If he's not even in control of this violence, it just kind of happens. What's the impetus? What's animating this violence? Very good. Page 233. After inflicting this intense violence on the boy, he starts to experience a rattling of nerves, which is perhaps the radical surfacing of guilt. So he's going to beat this kid ferociously, do unspeakable things to this, 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 this young man, this young boy, really, right? This, this uh, adolescent, uh, perhaps. But there is a repercussion, and it's coming from deep within, right? Uh, and he starts to... Uh, shake, right? He's starting to uh, experience a rattling of the nerves here, right? All of this kind of, I don't call it mindless violence, I call it unconscious violence that Jesse is capable of. We are starting to see that there is a repercussion to it. It's coming from deep within. However, however, he also feels a peculiar joy. Why does he get joy out of this? That's not an easy question to answer. That's not an easy question to answer. That would take a lot of articulation right, from, from all of us to answer that question. But he does get joy from this, which seems to stem from the memory he has from when he was a child. We'll, we'll get a lot of joy in that flashback as well. And that image of the, uh, of the torturous treatment of that black uh, man runs deep, and not to mention what happens to that black man's genitalia, completely cut off, right? He could feel threatened by black uh, virility and aspects of manhood and masculinity. Um, you've watched at this point, hopefully you've, wa uh, you've read through that information on the caricature of the brute and you're starting to get a sense of why that caricature was 
des uh, kind of invented in the first place, right? Uh, to show the power uh, and kind of boundless energy and virility of a black man if taken off the chains. And it was to provide an argument that that's why black people should never be taken off the chains because they are powerful. They have a kind of uber masculinity that seeks to obtain our white women, right? Keep in mind the KKK, the, the sole purpose of the KKK, their kind of mission statement, uh, and you can read up on this, was to protect, protect white womanhood. That was like their number one goal, uh, at first at least, was to protect white womanhood uh, and white virginity, right? And the brute caricature, uh, caricature was created to show what would happen to that white womanhood and white virginity if black people were let free and taken off those chains. Uh, you should watch the movie The Birth of a Nation. Uh, that should be a movie that everybody sees uh, as the brute caricature is highly on display in that film and you can get a sense of what was uh, essentially being uh, the, the ideas and messages that were being transmitted uh, to not only Southern American populations, white populations, but really the entire country at that point. It was a big, Birth of a Nation was a blockbuster, huge movie production. It was like the, the irony of that film, The Birth of a Nation, uh, from what I've learned, uh, is on one hand, it's, it's completely brimming uh, with racist uh, sentiments, but on the other hand, it w technically, as far as cinematography is concerned and, and filmmaking, it is the, the first major film that America had ever uh, uh, produced, right? Uh, uh, D.W. Griffith, uh, I think, was the director, producer, whatever. Just a blockbuster. Lots of money went into that film. Ironically, it's to uh, support, uh, you know, the ideas of the KKK, right? You can check that out. Okay, my question for you is, when we think about our day and age, uh, our uh, current day, do you believe white people feel threatened by notions of black masculinity? <laughs> Particularly white men. How about white women? Is there a difference between how white men feel threatened by black masculinity versus how white women feel threatened uh, by black masculinity. Uh, another good piece is Brent Staples' um, uh, 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 Just Walk On By, uh, where he talks about being a black man who has this incredible capacity for intimidating a white woman on the street, even though he does not mean to, probably because the culture uh, kind of supersedes him, right? Uh, and it's more powerful than who he is as an individual, the kind of cultural uh, prognosis of who black people are. Um, he, he, as his nerves are being kind of rattled, he also grabs his privates, right? So it's enough, another reference to that genitalia, maybe even kind of protecting it uh, as best he can. Um, so. On page 233, we start to realize that Jesse knows this young black boy, uh, and he's, he's constantly referred to as a boy. Boy here, the black uh, person uh, who is tortured at the end of this, in, in that flashback that Jesse has, he'll constantly be referred to as a man. So we're talking about that transition here, which is, is very interesting, analytically speaking. But he knows this boy from the past. He remembered this kid when he was just a, a, a small boy, right? And this boy says, we going to keep on singing until every one of you miserable white mothers go stark raving out of your minds. So the boy knows the effect uh, of the singing uh, on somebody like Jesse, right? He understands it. And it's, it's always, why is it so devastating to Jesse? because it's always going to be a reminder of his wickedness, right, and the role he plays. Uh, on page 234, uh, there is this emphasis on the familiar being displaced, and this is where we see this interesting uh, attempt, uh, how successful it is, uh, I guess, is, you know, depending on what your perspective is, but it's this attempt of Jesse to essentially victimize himself and the white race. And he's talking about everything being displaced, and he has this kind of flashback, right? Um, there's this emphasis on the familiar being displaced, ultimately an acknowledgement of hate and malice. What he as a white man uh, is and receives from this boy. He was first introduced to this malevolence as a child, hence the memory of the lynching, right? A big part of, of what comes out of that, uh, that displacement is times have changed. 
And one of the biggest changes that we can uh, talk about is suspicion. These young black boys and girls, especially when they were like four or five, right, just, just children, didn't harbor the suspicion of white authority, right? It took them time to understand the unjustness uh, and the injustice uh, of their society. And now they're becoming suspicious. And there's that displacement, right? Things are starting to change here. It's not the way that it used to be. On page 235, uh, as Jesse's rage peaks, so does his physical weakness. So his kind of psychology skyrockets in rage, but the body starts to feel the repercussions of that and it starts to weaken as well. It's almost like there's this kind of balance that, that, that's trying to occur within Jesse. And I, I do think he's, he's trying this text at all, right? Uh, but I think he's trying to at least kind of approach this sense of grace the forgiveness of God. But I don't think, especially when we look at the last scene at the very end, I don't think it really happens for him. But it does happen in the sense that at least he's being reminded of perhaps some of the most important events that help to construct the kind of person that he is. And of course, the event is what happens to that black man in the middle of the field with all those white people surrounding him. On page 230, uh, oh, let me just say, uh, so there's this rage. He retaliates against the authentic beginnings of realizing his sinful and hateful self. I think he's starting to see it. But he retaliates against that. He kind of rises up against that with an arrogant remark about how blacks should feel fortunate that whites have interbred with them. And this occurs on page 235. So I think there's like these, these kinds of you know, stings and pings of, of, of kind of, you know, moral consciousness that are starting to kind of come up here. But then he just absurdly retaliates against that and says, you should be lucky that white people have slept with black women and now we're making whiter people, right? That's basically, we're saving your race is what he says, which is a pretty God awful thing uh, to say. On page 235, he knows, he knows it. He even says it. He knows that these black people are singing for his soul too, how selfless they are. And that probably makes him feel even cruddier and even more filled with guilt, right? That I can treat these people so awfully and be the, uh, purveyor and the instigator of sin and malice and yet they're still going to sing for my uh you know as far as if you sing for my forgiveness right they're still going to keep me in mind that's got to make them feel pretty awful um it this is important uh, and I've, I've heard this in uh, at least uh kind of let's say uh, this idea perpetuated by a couple different people. Um, keep in mind that when you talk about slavery, and you know, not just in the American context, which uh, as um, Professor Blight from Yale and some of the lectures that I show does argue is the world's second biggest slave system or economy that the world had ever known. I think number one, he says, is like Russian serfdom. Uh, and then... There's Brazil. Brazil was pretty bad. You can look into this, but he, he argues that America was number two in history as far as a slave economy, the biggest, right? Um, so with all of these slave systems and economies that the world has ever known, yes, we understand that the slave is dehumanized, uh, especially on a physical level. Uh, they are kind of treated horribly. They are, uh, there is a violence and a kind of mistreatment, mistreatment inflicted upon them. But we can also turn that back, at least morally and ethically, on the slave master. Uh, they are dehumanized as well. They are made less than human themselves because they have sunk so low spiritually, ethically, morally as to enslave another person and treat them in the way that is fitting uh, for uh, a slave, right? So their conscience uh, has been completely lost and therefore they are dehumanized as well. A question I would give to you is which is worse? The dehumanization of the slave or the dehumanization of the slave master, right? Well, if you believe in, you know, religion and all these things, uh, maybe, maybe it's the slave master who is worse, right? That dehumanization is worse. But if you don't, right, maybe it's the physical stuff. Nobody wants to be a slave and be dehumanized in that kind of way. So it all depends on perspective.
I guess. Next up, he feels it's his duty to protect white people from the Obviously, you see the N-word uh, strewn throughout this text. Uh, it's to showcase a, a context, a time, and a place, and a people, and a period uh, of racism. Um, I don't like to say the word, to be quite honest. I don't even like to type the word uh, at all, uh, and I always apologize if I, if I do. Um, so I always just skip over it, but it's teach his own. You know, you can say it, do what you got to do. He, he does think it's, he says it's, it's his duty to protect white people from the ends and the ends for themselves. Now, I think I, we all understand that first part, protect white people from, uh, from black people. Got it, got it, right? That one makes sense. But then he says, and to protect black people from black people, from themselves. And that one probably takes a bit more interpretation and kind of, you know, uh, fleshing it out uh, as to what you think he means. Page 236, he seems to have a moral absolutism, uh, but that, that obviously um, needs to be broken down. He feels that the black people's hatred toward him is stronger than the physical violence that he can incur upon them. So this is Jesse who has relied on physical violence as leverage over black people basically his whole life. Maybe he got this from his father. His father feels a certain peace after he has seen uh, what has happened to that black man, black man in the middle of that field. Uh, maybe because a violence has been uh, uh, inflicted upon that man and that's where their sense of power came from. Jesse, within his own context, years and years and years later as he's a grown man, a police officer in this town, a sheriff, he feels like this violence is not enough anymore, right? Uh, and that the hatred and the suspicion coming from these black communities, these black people, is, is stronger. Also, he seems to have that moral absolutism, and it comes through a sort of victimhood, which could be a very dangerous type of moral absolutism, right? Uh, but it is on page 236 where there seems to be an eruption of conscience uh, for Jesse, right? Which is always important, an important part to look at, right? Because that's probably his major internal conflict is what's going on with his conscience. Um, he says they're, they're singing black folks into heaven. But they're also, the way he looks at these songs, they're singing white folks into hell, right? And it's all happening with the, with the singing and the songs. And this is all due to a perceived tangible black suspicion. A suspicion of what? And I think this was one of your questions. Well, just to say a couple things, a suspicion of trust, that maybe there, there used to be this kind of flimsy trust between black people and white people back in the day, which now, especially within the throes uh, of the uh, civil rights movement, that trust was never there or that trust has changed, right? So a suspicion of that trust, a suspicion of the power that white people have and how they arrive at that power, a suspicion of the afforded respect going back and forth between black and white, how can you respect us if this is the treatment, right? Now we're suspicious of that. And an overall suspicion of the past as well, including things that you might be thinking about as well. But what are black people now suspicious of? Page 237. He is part of what he feels. And there's, there's this, he describes these other men who are, who are older than him, who are part of his father's generation, who are barely kind of holding on any longer. In fact, they've essentially given up. And it's almost like Jesse's probably a little bit younger and he wants to try to kind of hold on to this kind of pro-slavery, uh, uh, racist uh, 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 society, right? Um, all these old white protectors of the white society are fearing uprisings and violent unrest and revolt from the blacks. They're fearful of it. But we as readers, this is key, I've mentioned this before, we have to remember there is no evidence of a violent uprising uh, and unrest or a potential for it. These white men are projecting their own guilt and propensity for violence and terror onto the blacks and now they are afraid. Black people are just singing. Black people are just holding that line together so they can register to vote and make changes to their society uh, through nonviolent means. It is the white people who have always had a monopoly on violence within this country, at least within the context we're exploring here. And now they're afraid 
of some fictional uh, unaccounted for violence from black people. Essentially, they're afraid, these white people are afraid of their own kind of violence, that the violence they have factually inflicted can now come back around, right? That, that, that's about as much guilt as you could possibly feel. When you treat somebody so bad that the only thing you fear is that same exact treatment, even if it's now no evidence coming from the other side. So there's fear of an armed black race. There's some other fears. There's a fear, and this is all on page 237, there is fear of Europe and progressive consciousness and policies toward minority groups, including Africans, right, that are uh, starting to uh, implement themselves more and more in these uh, European societies. And they also feel threatened by Washington, which has essentially proclaimed racial equity, the end of segregation, right, and is kind of calling the shots. So there's a fear uh, of these things, uh, and they feel betrayed by Washington. He says, they hate me. And, you are and he is finally realizing that he, he hates himself for justifiable reasons. Page 238, again, the white conundrum. Guardians of virtue, but guess what? No one cares, right? And I'll read a little bit from the text on page 238. So this is uh, the big paragraph on, on 238. I won't read all of it because it's pretty big, but I'll read a little bit here. Um, this is a great part of the text where you can start to kind of dive into what seems to be the mentality of a white racist who feels they are the protector of their people, right? Which is what the KKK basically is, right? They are protectors of white society. And if you go on YouTube or, or wherever and, and even, you know, listen to interviews, I mean, CNN, CNN even put the KKK on primetime, right? With that black comedian who went in there and, you know, talked to these guys and he's staring at burning crosses. It's, it's, it's a little surreal um, they're, that they're even given that, that kind of exposure. However, you can listen to these men uh, or these women in the interviews that they do and they, they see themselves as a guardianship, right? As protectors. I'll read 238. They rarely mentioned anything not directly related to the war that they were fighting. But this had failed to establish between them the unspoken communication of soldiers during a war. Each man, in the thrilling silence which sped outward from their exchanges, their laughter, and their anecdotes, seemed wrestling, in various degrees of darkness, with a secret which he could not articulate to himself, and which, however directly it related to the war, related yet more surely to his privacy and his past. They could no longer be sure after all that they had all done the same things. So essentially, coming out of the text for a moment, there's a disconnection amongst these men. They used to feel they had this kind of common priority and this kind of common bond, but now all of this is essentially kind of faded. Um, they had never dreamed that their privacy could contain any element of terror could threaten, that is, to reveal itself to the scrutiny of a judgment day while remaining unreadable and inaccessible to themselves. Nor had they dreamed that the past, while certainly refusing to be forgotten, could yet so stubbornly refuse to be remembered. They felt themselves mysterious, mysteriously set at naught as no longer entering into the real concerns of other people while here they were outnumbered by black people fighting to save the civilized world. Okay, very good. It's a good insight into the mindset uh, of a white man who feels he must protect his society and protect his race, uh, especially as it's all kind of crumbling and falling to pieces, right? One line I just want to kind of pick out of, from what I've read there is he does mention that, you know, I, uh, there's a transition here, another, th that, that theme again of transition. They used to see themselves as soldiers fighting a war and a war connotes virtue, right? And honor, but now they see themselves as accomplices in a crime. And obviously a crime is a complete lack of virtue and dishonor, right? So the war they once saw themselves uh, fighting has now just been instigating a crime, right? So the perspectives uh, on the roles that they had uh, in this act of guardianship has changed. Page 239, there's a reference here to the River Jordan. 
Uh, the River Jordan, uh, to, you know, you look up the illusion of this. Uh, threshold, it is a threshold to the promised land for the Israelites as they were uh, uh, escaping Egypt. And it also, uh, for an African-American context, uh, it symbolizes freedom for black people, right? It symbolizes that freedom. Uh, all right, very good. Grace on page 239 is composed while Jesse is completely frantic. So Grace is calm and collective. Jesse is frantic and uh, uh, almost, uh, in a sense, frazzled, right? Uh, page 239, also there's a paradox here. Uh, there's an overwhelming fear which yet contained a curious and dreadful pleasure. And there's a lot of paradox concerning Jesse, uh, whether it be in the current or in the flashback, where there's this kind of joy and terror all at the same time. And it's tough to make sense of in all honesty. Basically, on this path toward grace, figuratively speaking, grace, the grace of God, salvation, redemption, forgiveness, etc., you have to start fearing what or who you actually are, are, and then find that pleasure in finding forgiveness and salvation, right? There's going to be a lot of fear in realizing the sinful, your sinful ways, especially as a white person who has mistreated black people in such a way, right? Or any person who's mistreated somebody like this, right? It's going to be very fearful to confront the sins of yourself. But then the pleasure may come from kind of preparing yourself for redemption and salvation, right? Um, I was going to look it up for this lecture, but I, I can just speak to it generally. Uh, in one of his, uh, he's got a book called, uh, Baldwin has a, a nonfiction book called The Fire Next Time, and it's a series of essays. Uh, I think there might be like three or four essays in there, and I, I teach one of them for another uh, more part class, not the entire thing, but a piece of it. But I remember I read one thing in there that's always stuck with me. And it's like Baldwin, I read it after it had actually happened in my life, and, and I'm being very open and honest with you. In, in his writing, he says, I, he thinks, and he's a black gay man, right? So he's not coming from a white man's perspective per se, right? He thinks about it and theorizes, but he's, he's, he's not coming from that perspective. I am, right? Um, in, in, many, in many, many regards. He says that a white person, a white man especially, has to kind of learn to hate themselves before they can kind of you know, move on and be a more useful uh, kind of progressive person within the world. And, and uh, I kind of get that, right? A white, a white person needs to come, not, not with you as an individual, but who you represent within the society, what you represent in the society. You need to kind of come to terms with what white people have done in this country and around the world. And even that concept of whiteness, we can start to really get into that. Where did whiteness come from, etc. cetera, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a whole other kind of, you know, uh, you know, it's a whole other discussion. But a white person has to come to grips with what his or her people have done in this country and throughout the world. And only from there can they start to kind, kind of forgive themselves for being even associated with this. And then a real healing process can begin where they become a much more progressive part and element of uh, their societies. I, to each his own, I deeply agree with that idea. Right? I really do think that that's something that occurred with me. Uh, and it came through reading uh, and, and opening up myself to, to various perspectives and really history, right? History does not lie. Okay, very good. Uh, so the father uh, ridicules. Now we're in that flashback, um, which starts up on page 239. And one of the first things that occurs is the father ridicules the black spiritual singing uh, in the morning that's taking place. Um, it's weird. In the flashback, we start at the end of the day, and then it kind of goes back to the beginning of the day. And then, of course, we, we were, we're at that picnic, right, where that black man is essentially tortured and killed uh, at that event. But it actually starts when the flashback begins on page 239. It's at the end of the day, and the father is, is ridiculing the black spiritual in the morning that is occurring, I believe, for the black man that was killed that day. Um, he is, Jesse is reminded of his black friend, Otis. Otis, uh, if you look up the translation on Otis, is knowledge. It's interesting. Knowledge. 
moral knowledge, ethical knowledge, spiritual knowledge, knowledge, knowledge of so many different things. Uh, and when he's reminded of Otis, it makes him shiver now that he has witnessed the lynching. So now when he thinks about his black friend after seeing what's happened to this black man, he shivers. Page 240, Otis is too little to do anything, says the father. There's that theme of youth versus maturity. Otis can't do anything, he's just a kid. Well, let him grow up, educate himself to a certain degree, or through experience, start to understand the injustice of the society that he resides in, that he's a part of, then comes the suspicion, then comes the challenge, right? Then comes the fear for white people, right? But if they're just young and powerless, that makes it easy for us. Um, that's the theme of youth versus maturity. And there's always the fear that they will grow up, these black children, and be capable of doing something. But we know that, based on evidence of the story at least, the only thing those black children are going to grow up to do is sing, which is perhaps a, a kind of a, 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 a tool of uh, uh, incapacitating uh, uh, these white people, right? Because it's bringing out some real guilt and some real moral and ethical dilemma for them to deal with. You deal with this say something very quickly. Um, I have the movie over here. I bought it on Blu-ray. It was in the theaters, limited theaters. Uh, I Am Not Your Negro was a, a newer film. Uh, you can, you know, Netflix it, a DVD, uh, you know, Blu-ray. And Baldwin says, one thing he says over and over is, you know, if you feel the need to call me a, an N, an N-I-G-G-E-R, if you are a white person or any person for that matter, any race, any ethnic group, and you feel the need to call me that? Now, Baldwin's always just talking about white people. He's not really talking about Mexican uh, Americans and Asian Americans, etc. He's talking about white people. If you feel the need as a white man or a white woman to call me an N, that's, he says, that's your problem. That's your psychological dilemma and you gotta figure it out, not me. You gotta figure it out. It's your problem, right? And I think that's pretty brilliant. Uh, I think he's onto something there. Okay. Because when you grow up, when these black children grow up, they're gonna get suspicious. And they're gonna recognize, as I've mentioned before, the injustice, the suffering, and they will fully realize their oppression. And uh, perhaps more importantly, they'll fully realize their oppressor, right? Maybe even on some intimate level. On page 241, there's this one thing he recalls, and this is at the end of the day, following the killing of that black man in the field, his parents have sex. And, he, and, he, and he, he remembers this. Uh, and again, now we're talking about male genitalia once again, right? The use of male genitalia. My question is, what do you think is the significance of this aspect of his memory? Uh, the, the fact that he remembers, one of the last things he remembers is his parents had sex, right? And at the very end of that paragraph, and this is all on page 241, his father's breathing seemed to, seemed to fill the world. That's hyperbole. Obviously, it's filling the room or it's filling the house. But it's not filling the world, but now we have to analyze. In what way is the father's breathing after the sex of act, after witnessing what happened to that man in the field, after expressing the feelings and uh, sentiments and opinions that he does throughout the day, how is his voice filling the world that was one of your questions for your discussion, and I look forward to hearing that. Um, going back to the act of sex between his mom and dad, there's sex, creation, lineage. The genitalia is still working for the father here. It's in full working order and capable of intercourse as contrasted with the black man who has had his penis completely cut off and who has been burned following that. Therefore, from the father's perspective, perhaps subconsciously, one must be expelled from the world. A black man and black masculinity and black uh, uh, virility must be expelled from the world so that white man can survive. Page 242. He is shining and excited. There's a gleeful anticipation of the violence for uh, the father here as they're getting ready. Um, the mom wears her church dress. I don't think she wears it, but she considers wearing her church dress. So now you have a symbol of religion almost going, uh, almost being worn to go to uh, a, a pretty horrific event. Jesse ties up the dog 
and the dog immediately begins to bark. It's kind of a protest of some kind. Uh, maybe it's his conscience that he's tying up that's protesting. Um, the dog being chained up is interesting because the man will be chained up to the tree as well. So now we're starting to analyze. Sometimes, like I said, I just point things out for you. Now we can analyze the similarities uh, between the dog and the black man who was chained up uh, to a tree as well. His dad says they're going on a picnic, one he will never forget. And yes, his dad is completely right. He will not forget this. It is embedded deeply into his memory. Page 243, after hearing gleeful singing, coupled with perhaps a growing awareness of what may occur, all Jesse wants to do is talk to his black friend Otis. I think that could be the moral kind of side of him trying to reach out for something that could be helpful. All he wants to do right now is talk to Otis. In other words, if you look at the uh, uh, symbolic meaning of Otis, he wants to reach out and talk to knowledge, right? Some real knowledge. I'm sorry. I want to correct myself. Otis is not knowledge, it's wealthy. But I think you can make a correlation between wealth and knowledge, right? A wealth of knowledge. That, that could be one way of doing it. So I make that correction. Otis is the mediator, perhaps this kind of wealthy mediator that can shed light on the confusion that Jesse is feeling. So if I just say a little bit more about Otis here, how he wants to speak with Otis. Otis is the only mediator between him, Jesse, and a cloudy world, sharply ridden by hate and its common practice, right? He's seeing, I think he wants to reach out and talk to Otis so badly, this young black friend of his, because he's seeing the normalization of violence uh, and kind of uh, in, in intimidation and the sentiments of violence and intimidation uh, against black people, right? It's, it's everywhere at this point, and therefore he wants to kind of escape it and just hang, uh, be with Otis in this moment. We can contrast the singing here. Uh, this white singing might be why the black singing is so torturous. The white singing is kind of hell-bent uh, on uh, killing this black man. It's kind of festive and it's kind of, you know, ironically, it's disgusting all at the same time. Maybe this is why when he understands the, the significance of the white singing uh, as, you know, uh, in this flashback, that's why the black singing is so torturous to him, right? Uh, on page 244, because of the lynching, all black life in this area has ceased to exist. Everybody is shut up in their homes. Businesses have shut down. And I think this is the way the whites want it. Uh, probably the way these whites want it and why they enact such methods in the first place to antagonize, intimidate, and terrorize and keep black people contained, right? And that's why they engage in these lynchings, or in this case, this torturous uh, killing uh, of this black man and make it such a spectacle as well. A couple questions here. Uh, Jesse wants to ask his parents, where have all the black people gone? But he's afraid to ask the question. Why do you think he's afraid to ask that question? And of course, remember, he's a kid here. Another question, why do you think his parents are like uh, strangers to him now? Be specific, he says that. His parents are like strangers to him as he sees them in the front seat driving to this uh, event. On page 245, the sounds of laughing and cursing and wrath and something else. What could that something be? Perhaps it's the delight and the glee, the most troubling part. Page 246, the Negro boy is tied to a tree, just like that dog, just like their dog back at the house. Uh, and also there's a reference to a jungle and that's probably going back to seeing black people like animals. It's a way of dehumanizing uh, black people and seeing them as something less than human, right? And he's being conditioned to these stereotypes at a very early age, which is why you know, some people say, how do we end racism? I think some of my students were in part joking about this, but in part very serious. Um, some of my students at my high school. And, you know, that question comes up in a once in a while. Once in a while, how do we end racism? Just wait for all the old people to die, right? Because the idea is that you've been conditioned for racism throughout your entire life, that you get to your, into your 50s, 60s, 70s, nobody's going to change your minds on these things. Nobody's going to essentially condition or talk you out of it so the way to kind of cure racism is to have these older generations simply pass away, arguably, uh, so that newer, more progressive mindsets uh, can essentially uh, take hold within our society. Maybe that's happening nowadays. Uh, it's hard to say. 
but children's the key go after the children influence them indoctrinate them condition them as early as you possibly can right um, there is brutal torture taking place. This is where the story gets very difficult, um, and it can be difficult to read. Um, but, it's, but it's something we have to confront. This was reality. This was reality. We have to confront it. Uh, this is a discussion of sorts. The cry of all the people rose to answer the dying man's cry. So the cries of the people rise to meet the, the man's cries of death, right? Are these cries similar or are they different? The whites want this death to be prolonged, it says in the text, right? Which maybe is to broaden, uh, we can broaden this to an overlay of history and time. The whites want this treatment, this possibility of treatment and the power they hold to create this spectacle of suffering to instill such pain. They want this to be able to hold on to this capability for as long as possible. Black people justifiably want this to end. Whites hold death on a leash takes us back to that reference to the dog. On page 247, he's seated on his father's shoulders, but very far away from the event. My question for you is, what is the figurative analysis of this line? What does it mean, aside from the literal, I'm seated on my dad's shoulders, what does that mean on a more figurative level? I'm seated on my father's shoulders. Jesse feels his mother is more beautiful than she's ever looked before. This is where Jesse starts to you know, have some strange thoughts based on what he's seeing. Now, probably, why has she looked the most beautiful that she's ever looked before? Probably, probably uh, because she represents the virtue, the purity, and the innocence of white womanhood is most cherished and most protected in this moment when a black man, one who opposed a white woman's power and authority, remember he, uh, he knocks over a woman, I think her name was Miss Standing, Mrs. Standing, meaning she was standing up as a white person, nice and tall. And what does this black man do who's now being killed? He had, he, what was his crime? He had knocked her over. He had knocked her over, which figuratively speaking is a black man expressing you know, some kind of power uh, and some kind of presence within the society and knocking over this woman. And this is the retaliation, right? What's happening to him now. So this is a man, a black man who opposed a white woman's power and authority and is now having his masculinity, his dignity, and his own respective power dismantled and made for humiliation. Lots of paradox here. Beautiful and strange. Jesse sees his mother as the most beautiful and the most strange that he's ever seen her. That's one of your questions. How do we explain these, that, that particular paradox? Why is he feeling unprecedented joy here? You wouldn't think that a child would find joy in this. He says it's both beautiful and terrible. We continue to, uh, I guess you could say, struggle to figure out these paradoxes that we are given by the author. And you should do that. We might, I'm not going to do that right now. Uh, it's very hard to do. But we're given this paradox. He sees it as both beautiful and terrible all at the same time. If you can start to articulate that, you know, and analyze that, that paradox, you will uncover major profound meaning in this text. That's why we can't just gloss over this stuff, right? As readers, we have to really struggle to find meaning, especially when that meaning is obscured by strange language and paradox and devices. <laughs> he even says he wants to be the man that cuts off the black man's privates. He wants to be that guy. Why? And I would probably say to essentially emasculate the black population uh, is suspicious. Uh, a part of a forceful masculinity that also, uh, is suspicion, that black suspicion, is that a part of a forceful black masculinity that ultimately seeks to liberate itself, right? One thing he can't get out of his mind aside from the singing is, you know, the suspicions and the oppositional uh, character of that young boy in his prison, right? And it's based largely in suspicion, right? Largely in suspicion. Is that part of a threatening black masculinity that has to be uh, uh, disposed of, right? Uh, both literally and figuratively. Page 247, this is where it gets just creepy. 
but but really beautifully written. I mean, I hate to say it, say it that way, but it's beautifully written. This white man who's killing this, this black man and torturing him, he weighs the black man's genitalia. All right? And I think this is a good... You can just see him there kind of weighing these things, right? While the crowd's just looking on. It's just intense. This is probably a good part to apply what you know about the coon and the brute. Uh, we haven't really done any work on the coon. Remember, I use these terms academically, uh, not as far as kind of, you know, insults and, and derogatory language. Um, but definitely apply what you, you know about the brute when you think about this white man weighing out the testes and the genitalia of this black man. What is he weighing out in a figurative sense? And those testicles, that, that genitalia, it's uh, given, as far as the description in, this, in the uh, story, a heaviness. There's a lot of weight to them. What is it, what's, what's the weighing all about? It's, he's weighing out the threat that they present to the white race. This, upon analysis, reveals an insecure southern white people, especially men, so insecure that they feel they need to cut and demonstrate in public this need to erase a powerful black masculinity. Once again, there's so much paradox taking place here, right? Um, Jesse uh, recalls it was the largest and blackest penis that he had ever seen in his life. He says it was much, much bigger than his father's. And again, yes, we can talk about this literally, but perhaps figuratively as well. More uh, virile, uh, more uh, uh, powerful, right? More imposing uh, this penis compared to his father's penis. And the white hand is strangely cradling it and caressing it before, of course, cutting it off. And there's a contradiction. Why would this white man be caressing it uh, when he's about to cut it off, right? How do we explain and analyze that contradiction? After the event, another question. Uh, I don't know if I asked this on your discussion questions. Why is the father's eyes at peace after such violence and terrorism? The father's eyes are at peace. And Jesse loves his father. Uh, perhaps because of the demonstration of this peace, right? That he could actually find peace in something like this. Also, I think it's also, you know, Jesse who is probably in some part horrified by what, by what he's seen. Maybe he loves the peacefulness in his father's eyes because at least there is some peacefulness, peacefulness there, right? And he'll take whatever he can get. Um, we have to remember what Jesse will become uh, based on this experience. Simply return to the beginning of the story when... You know, he's basically, you know, uh, you know, beating people up uh, and, and cattle prodding uh, that, that young boy in prison. Page 248. This is important. I got a star on my notes here. Um, this, based on what he's seen and maybe his father's kind of, you know, reaction to it all. This was the test, the secret, and the key to his life forever. And that's what authors will do. They'll be like, what he saw that day, this was his test, his secret, and his key. And we have to, as readers, people who are analyzing these stories and interpreting them, we have to move beyond and say, well, in what way was that event and kind of the reactions to that event, um, how was that the key and the secret and the, uh, the test, the secret, and the key to his life forever? And here's my take on it. That black man's body is dehumanized, brutalized, objectified, discarded, but I would argue never forgotten. Because this body and the process of this body is crucial to a white identity that yearns to remain white in a political, social, economic, and cultural sense. If you can brutalize and, objectif and, and, and objectify uh, a, a black man in that kind of way, then you can keep the power that you so desire. That's the key. And that's why violence is the only leverage that Jesse has. But the violence is giving out to the singing, as we've stated before. Page 249, the narration cuts to the present time at the very end of the text. And he's back in bed. Grace stirs, of course she would, uh, as Jesse has recounted his most profound sin. He's, he's given it all to her. He's gone into the, 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 you know, the memory of this and he's, he's just exposed it all and, and kind of relayed the information to Grace and she, she stirs. Just like he stirs after enacting and inflicting so much violence on black people, right? He gets the same shivers as well. Well, she stirred. 
and you know it's it's one thing it's one thing to talk about this event it's another to draw strength from it and i think jesse that's the sick nature of his character nobody's saying you got to like the main character of the story you can feel compassion for him i think we have to all right right just like the singing um uh is is maybe for for jesse just as much as it is for black people we can have that compassion that sympathy because we want him to find salvation and grace but we are also very critical of him because i think in recounting this horrible killing of this black man and his father and everything involved he draws strength from this and it allows him it allows him to go to work the next day and keep on being the guardian that he thinks he is where his only means uh to uh, uh, uh being that guardian is this immense violence that he is capable of this is i mentioned this earlier the boy in the cell is likened to the man in the fire but the but the boy transitions to a man right which means that a resentment and contention which is what that boy represents in that cell resentment contention suspicion transitions to a state of being dominated and death which is what that black man in the uh middle of that clearing uh, is jesse recognizes he is the key essential and guaranteeing or at least fighting for this transition that I can be the key in, in, in turning a young, suspicious, resentful black child into death and uh, 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 obscurity. Obscurity in the sense that I'm taking a kind of powerful black presence and I'm basically putting it in its place, right? Through an, an amazingly intense violence. There's more paradox at the end here. He doesn't, he's crying and laughing all at the same time. His role in this life is torturous. He is trapped. To be this violent guardian, but to also, uh, uh, at some, uh, on some level, understand the sinful person that he is. But he's trapped right in the middle. There's no way out of this. This is strange. He tells Grace, his wife, I'm going to do you like a N-I-G-G-E-R. I'm going to do you like an N. And, and he says, and you're going to love me like an N. We have to do some careful analysis on the difference between do, and we're talking about the act of sex here. What's the difference when I say I'm going to do you versus I'm going to love you, right? What's the difference? And whatever that difference is that you analyze, you understand who it's being connected to. Jesse is going to do you like an N, right? Um, and he's asking Grace to love me like an N. And, and love from grace kind of makes sense. Grace is love. Grace is even love for the sinful. Grace is even love for the sinful. On a figurative sense, maybe he's, you know, maybe he's at least approaching that grace here. In his awful, awful self. Maybe he is. So a major contrast between do and love. Jesse has always unapologetically and with a lack of grace done what he has done. Only grace can love and extend that love to a black man. However, you know, the way he treats Grace, it could, it could be that there's no hope here. I'll just read uh, some, some, some notes from my annotations uh, at the end here. You know, it seems like we're left with the objectif uh, objectification and dehumanization of a black man, just a body to be carved and burned, uh, a body that deserves violence, a body deserving of violence, right? Uh, at the very end, too, after, they, you know, after they've cut off the penis, um, everybody then, I think it's mentioned, like the people join in, kicking and cutting and it just, just savage, right? Just savage. Um... Jesse never asks what the guy did to deserve it, right? I guess it, it doesn't matter. I think that'll do it. Uh, so I, I really do look forward to just getting your initial reactions to this text and seeing what you have to say. Uh, and I'm sure we'll put a discussion post up uh, so that you can, as a class, share uh, kind of those reactions and your analysis and um, uh, your understanding of the piece. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this story. I love reading stuff that kind of takes me out of my comfort zone. Uh, and don't even, you know, not to say that I have much of a comfort zone. Uh, the next Baldwin short story uh, that you'll be reading and I'll be doing a lecture on, it's a long piece, so get ready for a long short story, uh, but, but much different, um, much different. Uh, so it'll be a nice kind of change of pace. Uh, hope you all have a beautiful day and uh, thank you so much.
Thank you.